to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the scripture says cast all your cares upon him he cares for you. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse number 7. We welcome you to our study of the subject of prayer. Today we're going to be thinking about some of God's laws that govern the subject of prayer and how we can know those so that our prayer life will be so much richer. We encourage you to stay tuned as we find out what these laws are. The Bible teaches that if I'm going to pray in a way that really is according to the will of God, 1 John 5, verses 14 through 16, I must pray through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praying by His authority, His guidance, and in His name is one of the first laws that governs the subject of prayer. Listen to the words of Jesus as He speaks on this in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Jesus taught His disciples in John 14, verse 13, And whatever you ask in My name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. We turn over to John chapter 15, verse number 16, and Jesus says similar words. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Whatever you ask the Father, in my name he may give you. And then notice John chapter 16, verse number 23. In that day, Jesus said, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. What are one of the laws that governs the subject of prayer? Jesus taught His disciples, first of all, ask me in my name. And then He said, there's a day coming where you're not going to ask me in my name. You'll ask the Father in my name. There's the idea. For Christians today, we pray to the Father. Our Father who is in heaven, Matthew 6 verse 9. But whom do we pray through? We pray in the name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let's stop for just a moment and let's ask, what does it mean to really pray in Jesus' name? I've heard that, you've heard that, we're familiar with that idea, but what does it mean to do something in someone's name? Well, it means by their authority. We are praying and we're asking by the authority of Christ. Colossians 3 verse 17 says, Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through or by Him. You see, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28 verse number 18. He is the very Son of God who is now at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the head of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we pray, we're praying by His authority, meaning that Jesus taught us how, the Word of God teaches us how, and it's by His sacrifice and Him as mediator that we can approach the very throne of Almighty God. And so when we say in Jesus' name, we're saying by His authority, by His command, by Him being the one who's authorized this action to be true and right. But when we say in Jesus' name, there's also another idea uniquely tied to that. Not only does it mean by His authority, it means we're praying to God through Jesus as our mediator, as the one who makes that avenue of communication possible. Now, we mention again 1 Timothy 2, verse number 5. There is one God and one mediator, watch this now, between man and God. Well, who's that mediator in between man and God? The man Christ Jesus Himself. Jesus is the mediator. 
if we could use the word, the, the go-between, as it were, the one who communicates from both sides in some ways. He's the one through whom we pray to the Almighty. Romans chapter 8, verses number 3 and 4, or verse 34, and Hebrews 7, verse 25 tells us clearly that Christ plays a role and function in mediator between man and God, and no doubt that would apply in prayer. And so here's the application. If I'm to play, pray in Jesus' name as by His authority, I'm going to pray the way He taught me to. If I'm going to pray through Him as a mediator, we honor Him and we recognize He is the Son of God and it's His authority that makes this possible. Secondly, as we think about unique laws that govern one's prayer, we realize that prayer must be according to God's will. If a prayer is going to be acceptable to God, it needs to be prayed according to what God desires, according to the way God has taught prayer to be, and it needs to have the mindset of, if this is pleasing and approved by God. Uh, 1 John 5, verse number 14. If we ask anything according to His will, we know He hears us. But there's the qualification. If it's according to His will. You remember Jesus' disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray? Well, according to God's will is one of the ways that we pray. Now, when we say prayer needs to be according to God's will, what exactly does that mean? Well, it means that it needs to be according to His revealed will. How do we know God's will? How do we know anything about God? We know Him by the things that are written. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 11 through 13. If I'm to pray according to the will of God, and, and this book, the Bible, is God's revealed will, then I'm going to pray according to the Scriptures. I want to see how God wants me to pray. I want to see the attitude God wants me to pray with. I want to see, as we've looked in our previous lessons, specifically what God wants me to pray for and, and how God wants that done. But you know, when we think about praying according to the will of God, not, not only do we want to have the mindset, I want to pray according to the Bible, but I want to pray that if it's according to God's divine will today as well. And here's what we mean by that. In 1 John 5, 14 and Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, uh, Luke 22, verse 42, when Jesus prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Here's His wording. Not my will, but Thine be done. Jesus prayed that the ultimate will of God in His life then would be done. And friend, when we pray, whether we're praying for a job, whether we're praying for somebody who's sick, whether we're praying for evangelism, whatever it may be, we want to have the mindset, this is what we would like to do, this is how we want to accomplish your will, we're praying that you'll help us with these efforts, if it's your will. If that's your plan, if that's your desire, help us to accomplish these things. If not, we don't want those things to succeed as well. And so when we pray, let's put God's will before our own. And you know, no doubt that's hard. We all have things that we desire. We all have things that we are convicted of in our own mind that need to come true. But all of that must be prefaced and predicated upon, is this really what God wants? Is this how God wants me to succeed? Is this the will of God in my life? A third law specifically that we're going to elaborate on today is we must pray in faith, that is in full assurance of faith. Notice the words of James chapter 1, beginning in verse number 5. The Bible says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." What is the law that governs prayer as it relates to faith? I've got to pray in full assurance of faith. Now, we need to ask several questions from the Scripture to really understand the idea implied here. What is faith is the first question we ask. Well, faith 
comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I get faith by reading, studying, hearing, looking to the Bible and learning about God. And so that's where I find faith. But what is faith? Faith is a conviction in God. Hebrews 11 verse 1, faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is based on evidence and based on sub substance. As I read the Bible and I learn about God, as I look to God's Word and I find proof that this book is from God, as we, as we look to the heavens and they declare the glory of God and we look at the evidence of God's existence, we know we're convicted of God. When I pray in faith, not only am I praying according to the Bible, I'm praying with a knowledge based on the evidence that God does exist, that He does hear, and that He is more than willing and able to help those who are in need. And so when a person prays for wisdom, and he prays in full assurance of faith, that person is praying knowing God wants to help, that there is a God, that He wants to help, that He's able to help, and that that person is convicted that God can help them in their life. You know, in this idea, we sure need to do away with the thinking that I think sometimes, if we're not careful, can exist. And that thinking is, maybe God hears. Maybe there's a God out there. Uh, wishful thinking is the idea of prayer. I'll, I'll just try this and see if it works. That's not the kind of prayer that God desires. Full assurance of faith, absolute conviction in who God is and His power to help us is a big part of what prayer is and how that works in such a way that it will honor Him. Now friend, we want to mention another law governing prayer and this law is specifically related to our heart being right with God, for prayer to be what God wants it to be. I've got to have a desire to seek God with all my heart and to honor Him in every way with my life. I want you to listen to the words of Psalm 34 and I want you to notice what the psalmist says in verse number 4 about really seeking God and honoring Him with our heart. Here's what the scripture says, Psalm 34 verse number 4 the Bible says, I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Do you notice the direct connection there? I sought the Lord, David said. He heard me and delivered me. Seeking God and God hearing a person go hand in hand. Isn't that what Jesus taught specifically in Matthew 6? You know, we've got these cares and anxieties, food, shelter, clothing, all the worries that we have. Jesus said, you don't have to worry about those. Why not, Lord? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. There's another passage that I want you to notice as it relates to this idea of seeking God. And it's a beautiful passage found in the major prophet Jeremiah. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 29 beginning in verse number 12. God said, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Now watch this. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Again, do you see the connection? God's listening. God's hearing. His people are seeking and searching after Him. That's the mindset that God wants of His children. Seek God with all your heart. Seek, knock, and ask. Jesus said, if you seek, you'll find. If you knock, the door will be opened. If you ask, it'll be given unto you. Look at the correlation of all that. I'm seeking, I'm knocking, I'm asking. God's doing His part. Opening, receiving, finding, all that is dependent upon my ability to put God first and really do the things God wants me to do. And so putting God first in one's life is such a big part as it relates to prayer. And then we mention another law that indeed does govern prayer, and that is humility of heart. What kind of attitude, what kind of heart does God want us to have when we pray to Him? I want you to notice the words of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, for I think the heart and the attitude of, of Solomon here is so beautifully illustrated. 2 Chronicles 7 verse number 14, God says, if my people 
who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, notice the correlation, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins and heal their land. What do we know about the right heart? God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face, then I'll hear them, then I'll forgive them. Friend, directly tied to my ability to pray as God wants me to is humility of heart, having the right attitude, humbling ourselves before God. Luke chapter 14, verse number 11. We again mention two men went up to the temple to pray. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse number 10. The first man was a man who thought he was right. He was a Pharisee. And as he approaches the temple, here's the attitude he's got. God, thank you that I'm not like everybody else. Unjust, murderers, adulterers, or even like this old sorry tax collector over here. I give, I fast, I tithe. Second man, tax collector, who's standing there, no doubt probably heard that, said this. He beat his breast, wouldn't even look up to heaven, but said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus asked a question based on that. He said, which of these two men do you think went down to his house justified? They answered rightly and said, the second. The one who knew he was wrong and knew he needed God. Not the one who thought he was right and thought God needed him. And there is a huge difference. When I pray, I need to pray with humility of heart. Friend, what does it really mean to pray with a humility of heart? Well, first it would mean that prayer is devoid of human pride. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. When I approach God in prayer, I realize, and you, when you've done all those things commanded, you say, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done that which is my duty to do. Like the tax collector, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the humility of heart being devoid of pride that God really wants. It's a realization of, of man's inability to help himself apart from God. Uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Instead, acknowledge Him in all your ways. He'll direct your paths. Jeremiah 10 verse 23, Jeremiah expressed it in such a humble way. O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. That's real humility of heart. Humility of heart always has the will of God first. Not my will, but thine be done. There's real humility. It's hard to pray that when you really want something. But that's real humility of heart. Luke chapter 22, verse number 42. And then involved in humility of heart is a willingness to really let things be in God's hand. Cast all your cares upon Him. Turn it over to God. Let God deal with it. Do away with the anxiety and the fear and worry. Lay your cares at the throne of God. Have the humility of heart to say, God, I'm giving this to you. I don't know how else to deal with it. That's the real humility that God wants each of us to have in this life and to do the things that He wants us to do. And so as we think about certain laws that really govern prayer, we need to realize prayer does play such an important role in the Christian's life. Jesus clearly is an example of prayer for every child of God, and He clearly taught His people to pray. Pray to the Father in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 9. We look at the example of Jesus' prayer. In John 17, He prayed for Himself, he prayed for His immediate disciples then, but He said, not only do I pray for these, I pray for also those who will believe on Me through their name, that they all may be one. He prayed for Christians as well. And so we see the power of prayer in approaching God's throne and doing exactly what God wants us to do. But friend, as another law, we also must realize prayer is a special and specific privilege given to the child of God. It's a blessing. Remember Ephesians 1 verse 3, all spiritual blessings 
are ours, the Christians in Christ Jesus. To be in a relationship, to pray to God, I've got to be a Christian. It is a special benefit for God's children. Does the world have that benefit? Absolutely not. God heareth not the prayer of sinners. John chapter 9, verse number 4, and John 9, verse 31. If we regard iniquity in our heart, God does not hear. Psalm 66, verse 18. If I turn my ear away from hearing the law of God, He will not hear. Proverbs 28, verse 9. But what about the Christian? If I obey the gospel, if I become a child of God, I have the power of prayer that only unique to God's children. I want you to listen again to Hebrews 4, verse 16. To God's children, here's what He says. Let us come boldly. Look at the boldness. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? That we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. This is a benefit that is so unique to a Christian that it ought to make every person want to become a child of God. And so, as we kind of think about prayer today, let's tie that in with one's need to obey the gospel and become a Christian. If one is not a child of God, he does not have the blessing and benefit of prayer that God desires for him to have. We say, well, how does one become a Christian? Friend, it's not hard. Becoming a Christian is simply taught in the Bible. First, one must realize that Jesus is the way the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by Him. John 14, 6. Are you really willing to believe that there's no other way to approach God except through His Son, Jesus Christ? Here's what Jesus said. Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8, verse 24. The uh, Ethiopian eunuch was traveling down the road with Philip in the chariot. And as he had heard about Christ, as he had heard about the plan of salvation, in the distance he sees uh, the waters of baptism, we might say, and he's ready to get in Christ. Here's water. What hinders me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Acts chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. And so we ask you today, do you really believe Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world? If you do believe that, are you willing to turn from sin and turn to God. Are you willing to repent? Acts 3 verse 19, Peter said, Repent and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. If you're willing to not only believe in Christ, but turn from sin and turn to God, friend, you're on your way to becoming a child of God. Would you do what Jesus said in confessing Him? Matthew 10 verse 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. To that Ethiopian eunuch, whom Philip said, If you believe with all your heart you may, he said, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Having made that confession, would you do what Jesus said to be saved? Here's what he said, so plain, so simple, so clear. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. Did Jesus say you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved? Well, friend, there's no doubt that he did. John 3 and verse 5, Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Paul said in Galatians 3, verse 27, As many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. How do you get in Christ? The only way the Bible teaches one gets into Christ is through baptism. Both in Galatians 3, 27 and in Romans 6, verses 1 through 4, it is baptism that puts one in Christ. In Christ is where all spiritual blessings are. Ephesians 1, verse 3, in Christ is where salvation is. 2 Timothy 2, verse number 10 through 12. And friend, in Christ, I can assure you, is where the benefit, the privilege, and the joy of prayer is realized. If you've never obeyed God's plan of salvation, friend, we want you to know today, God loves you immensely. We love you more than anything 
It's the motive and the way we say things, why we say things. More than anything, we want you, God wants you, to become a Christian, to obey the gospel, to put on the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you've not done that, then ask yourself, consider seriously, why have I not done these things? And if I keep delaying it, will I have time? Am I sure? I'll have time later. And so we hope these studies on the subject of prayer have encouraged each of us to pray with earnestness of heart and to make sure we're in a relationship with God so that prayer can have the powerful results we want it to. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the gospel of Christ.